like for us to think about just for a few moments bringing back the book. That's what I want us to focus our mind on. Bringing back the book. There is a portion of the Bible that tells us about the various kings that ruled over God's people. However, we must understand the background behind this history. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, God called Abraham. He told him to leave his family, to leave his city, to leave all that he knew and go into a land that God would show him. And God says, whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And through your descendants, through your seed, will all the nations of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, verse number 3. In Genesis 12, verse number 7, God promised the descendants of Abraham, the Israelite people, a special land. And so God was going to bring His Son into the world through the seed of Abraham, and they would have this special land, the land of Palestine, to which God would send His Son. But before God's Son came to the earth, there were various kings who ruled over God's people. These kings give us a lot of information. And there is a lot of information and a lot of lessons for us to learn from the various kings who rule God's people. In my experience in the church, I've found that many people in the church know very little about these kings. Now most members of the church of Christ, they can tell you the first three kings that ruled the Jewish people. They can rattle that right off for you. In fact, most of their children can even tell you the first three kings of Israel. But when you get into the other kings that rule God's people, I find that we are quite deficient in our knowledge of these kings. And that's very unfortunate because these kings not only provide us with valuable and significant history, they teach us many, many valuable lessons. Let us never forget Romans 15, 4. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. All this information about these kings is not just history for mere history's sake. It is to teach God's people valuable lessons. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Paul talked about things that happened in the Old Testament. And he, th he said these things happen for examples, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. They have been written and preserved for God's people. I want us to talk briefly about a man by the name of Josiah. This individual was a king over the kingdom of Judah. He was only eight years old when he came to the throne. We can learn about this man in the Bible in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23 and in 2 Kings Chronicles chapter 34 and 35. For the sake of time, today I want us to focus in on chapter 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. And if you have time when you get home, you might just read that entire chapter about this individual. When you start reading about Josiah, he's an amazement really. He grew, he grew up in very evil surroundings. He grew up in a very corrupt environment. 
In fact, his own relatives were ungodly and corrupt. His grandfather, a man by the name of Manasseh, that you can read about in 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and 33, he ruled God's people for a period of time, and then he died. He was very ungodly. At the end of his life, he repented, but most of his life, he was a very ungodly, wicked person. And then his son Ammon came to the throne. He is the father of Josiah, and he was also very wicked and ungodly. So you see, you got his grandfather and his father who lived such very wicked, ungodly lives. He was surrounded by ungodliness. You might wonder how he could be worth anything to God's kingdom coming up like that. You know, we have a saying in America, have you heard it? The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I've heard people talk about individuals and and make comments like this. Well, what else could you expect from them? Look at their parents. And so we just kind of have the idea that people just grow up like their parents. You know what the Bible teaches in Ezekiel 18, 20 and following? The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. We read in Romans 14, 12, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Yes, Josiah grew up in a very ungodly environment. But early in his life, he decided he wanted something different in life. Early in his life, he decided he wanted to be different. If you have grown up in ungodly circumstances, Do not despair. You do not have to continue in that. That's the easiest thing to do. All that corruption that you saw growing up every day of your life, all that evil and ungodliness, you understand that. You know that. You're familiar with that. So it's easy just to go with what you're familiar with and just be like like you've always seen. That's the easiest thing to do. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to act the way that you were raised if it was ungodly. Revelation 22, 17. You have a choice. Whosoever will, let him partake of the water of life freely. God gives you free will. You can choose to be different. You don't have to be that way. You can have a better life. That's what Josiah had. His grandfather, his father, chose to live for the devil. They chose by their own free will, ungodliness, They forsook the God of heaven. They lived in the ways of the world. That's what they wanted. Josiah comes along and he decides he wants something different. He had a better life, a different life, and so can you. Look in chapter 34. In verse number 2, Josiah did what was right in the eyes of God. Didn't turn to the right, didn't turn to the left. But you go back to chapter 33, and you read about his grandfather and his father, and it says they did evil in the sight of the Lord. You contrast those two people. 
His father and grandfather, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And you contrast that in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 2 with Josiah. He did what was right in the eyes of God. Very refreshing. Verse number 3. 2 Chronicles 34 verse number 3. While he was yet young... Some people think you've got to wait till you're old. Some people think you've got to live your life out in worldliness and get all that out of your system, and then when you get old, then you choose to seek God. Well, look what it says about this man. While he was yet young, this man chose to seek after God. Verse 3. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. Remember thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Young people, here is an, a great example for you. Here's one of those unsung heroes of the Bible. We don't hear much about Josiah, but he's one of the great heroes in the Bible. And as a young person... Sixteen years old. He began to reign when he was eight. Of course, he had help. But eight years later, at the age of sixteen, he made a decision in his life. I want to seek God. What a beautiful decision for a young person to make. Make it while you're young, before all your habits of life have formed. You are forming habits, young people, right now, that may very well last the rest of your life. Start forming habits that are good and godly. Reading the Bible, praying to God, trying to find the God of heaven, trying to live for Him. Make that decision. While you are young. Josiah, because of verse 3, because he decided at the age of 16 he was going to serve God, his entire life changed. See, it wasn't just a flippant decision. It wasn't just a nice little religious time in his life. This changed his whole life. Everything he did from now on is going to be different. And so as the leader of God's people, in verse 4 and following, he starts leading all these religious reforms. He starts bringing people back to the book because they have strayed so far away. Josiah begins to make all of these reforms. And in verse 8 and following, just keep reading there in Second Chronicles 34. He makes the decision that the temple needed to be repaired. It had been in desolation during the years of his grandfather and father. It had idols in it. It had been desecrated. So he makes the decision to repair God's house. You know, God had never intended for sacred things to be desecrated. Sacred things like the temple and the priesthood and the worship of God. God never intended that these holy sacred things be desecrated by His people, but that's exactly what they had done. It reminds me of the time when Jesus was on earth and He went down to the temple of God in Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13. And a place that was to be a house of worship, a place of holiness, they had turned into a business affair. Jesus said, My Father's house is to be called a house of prayer and you have made it a den of thieves. And he started to run them out of the temple. 
That's an image we don't have of Jesus, isn't it? You know, he wasn't just a quiet, little, meek person who never said anything to offend anyone and he just kind of went along with it. That's not the kind of person Jesus was. He wasn't afraid of controversy like some of us in the churches of Christ. He went right into the temple and told them, this is to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. And then he starts to run them out of the temple. God never intended that holy things be desecrated by man. And think about His church. Bought with the blood of Jesus, Acts 20 and verse 28. Think about how the church has been desecrated in our day and time. Men want the Lord's church to be nothing more than another denominational church. They want to bring in human creeds and human traditions and human ideas. They want to change the worship. They want to make everything modern. And they want to bring in innovations and change God's church. God is not going to take it well when we drag His precious church through the dregs of denominationalism when we make it nothing more than a den of entertainment, when it is nothing more than a refuge for disobedient people who don't want to follow the Bible and who want to do as they please, God is not going to take that well. And when Josiah saw how they had so desecrated God's house, he said, something's got to be done. So he said, Repair the temple. They are repairing God's house, and you never believe what they find. They find God's book. Now, think about this. How could God's people lose God's book in God's house? Think about that one. How could that happen? People can go so far away from God and they can leave the ways of God. This is the kind of thing that happens. And so they find this book of the law. It's been lost. They bring it to Josiah. And they read it to him. And they read the portion in there that explains how God's people and God's king is going to be punished Because God's people have forsaken him. And they read that to the king. All he would have had to say is, cut off his head. I want this disrespectful person executed for being disrespectful to God's king. He is so negative about God's people, I want him killed. They read that book to Josiah, and Josiah was so tender-hearted, something that's not elevated in a lot of people's minds in this church. He was tender-hearted. Do you get that? Not hard. Not mean. He was tender-hearted. And when he heard the Word of God read in his presence, it broke his tender heart. And he begins to make all of these reforms all through the land of God's people, bringing them back to the book. So what do we have in chapter 34? The rediscovery of God's book. Beautiful time for God's people. They have now found the standard. Rediscovery of God's book. Then it's read to the king. What is the effect of the book of God on the heart of the king? Well, first of all, he wants to know more. And he said, go down to the house of Huldah the prophetess and find out more about God's will. It reminds me of that song that we sometimes sing, 
more about Jesus would I know. More, more about Jesus. When he heard the Word of God, he wanted to know more of it. His heart was tender. He was tender-hearted and sensitive. You know what the Bible says? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 in the New Testament. Paul talked to the people at Thessalonica, and he said, when I came and preached to you, He said, you didn't receive it as the word of men, but you received it as it truly is, the word of God, which effectively worketh in you that believe, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. What effect does the word of God have on you? You just leave out of here mad? You get upset? Well, who's he talking about? What has he got in mind? Instead of just accepting what the Bible has to say and repenting of our sins, we got all kind of excuses and we got all kind of defenses that are set up that we couldn't hear the Word of God if we wanted to. We are, our hearts have become so hard, we're not going to listen to it. So we become angry and upset. Or we make excuses. This man, when he heard the Word of God, you don't read one excuse. He could have said, well, it's all these people. They're the ones that are all messed up. You don't read one excuse. You see a tender-hearted man just accepting what the Bible had to say and changing his whole life. What effect does the Word of God have on you when you hear it? So they go to the prophetess Huldah and they ask her about God's will. And she says, the king that heard that book, because his heart was tender, because he humbled himself in the sight of the Lord, he's not going to see the punishment that's going to come to God's people. The rest of you are going to be horribly punished because you have forsaken God. The effect of the Word of God on this man, it changed his whole life. What does it do for you? It's alive. It's powerful. Hebrews 4.12 It's the power of God to save your soul. Romans 1.16 It will cut right down into the deepest, most parts of your soul and heart if you will allow it, if you become so hard and insensitive that you will not listen to it, it can do nothing. But because God has given you free will, if you will listen to the Word of God, it can change your whole life. So what did Josiah do? He spent the rest of his life bringing God's people back to the book. That's what his whole life is now about. That's the most important thing in his whole life, is getting God's people back into the Bible. You look at modern day religion. In many cases, the Bible is ignored. All kinds of gimmicks are used to get people into church buildings. They even give things away. They even give away tickets and and have all kinds of things that will attract people to get them into a church service. Every kind of gimmick you can imagine and some you can't imagine are being used in modern day religion in this very location it's being done. Religious thinking people need to go back to the book. They need to go back to the book, and in going back to the book, you have to discard all human tradition, all human doctrine, and just go back to the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.15, from a child, 
you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through Christ Jesus our Lord. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable, it is useful for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When you have the inspired Word of God, why would you want to be led by some book that some group of men wrote that are not even inspired? Why would you want to go to some church that's being led by some group of men that are just giving their opinions and their ideas about religion? When you can have the Word of God. Religious thinking people need to go back to the Bible. They need to go back to the book. We need to go back to the book in our doctrine. We need to go back to the book in our practices. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 9, In vain do they worship Me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Some little prayer book? Who wrote that prayer book that you read every day? Who wrote it? You ever just ask yourself, who wrote this little book? Who wrote this little book that I'm giving my life for? Some group of religious men. When you can have the Word of Almighty God and be led by the Word of God, why would you go by some little prayer book that some group of men have written? Well, I've always believed this way. Well, the Hindus have always believed that way. Does that make it all right? This is what my family believes. That's what the Hindus say. That's what the atheists and the Hindus and the Buddhists say. We need to go back to the book in our daily living. It's not just a nice book to learn things and be able to spout off answers. It's a book to change your life. It's a book that that will give you a better life. Jesus said in John 6.63, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6.68, Peter said to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. In the Bible is found words of eternal life. In church tradition is found the words of men. You want to believe the words of men? That's your choice. I personally would rather believe the Word of God. Not just accept what my mama thought or my daddy thought. I'd rather accept what God has to say, wouldn't you? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. We need to go back to the Bible when we tell people how to be forgiven of their sins. Modern day churches will tell you, accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Say this little prayer. Have the sinner's prayer and say that prayer and believe in the Lord in your heart and He will forgive your sins. That's not what the book says. Yes, the book says you better believe in Christ in John 8, 24. If you don't believe in Him, you're going to be lost. But the book also says you have to turn away from your sins. Acts 17, verse 30. You have to turn away from your sins. You want to have your sins forgiven? You have to turn away from them. You can't just continue in them and God just forgive you. You want to have your sins forgiven? You've got to confess Jesus before men. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You want to have your sins forgiven? You have got to be immersed in water. Not to join the Catholic or some Protestant denominational church. But you have to do it to have your sins forgiven forgiven we need to go back to the book and having our sins forgiven you can do that now while we stand and sing